Hey Binanceians, it's Tina Baker Taylor here from Binance UK and I am really excited and delighted to be joined today by Apolline Blandin, who is the research manager at the Cambridge Center of Alternative Finance. Hey Apolline, thanks for joining us today. Hi Tina, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. Um, I'm super excited about our conversation today, but before we get into that, um, why don't you take a minute or two and just introduce yourself to our audience. Um, let us know what you do um, and what the Cambridge Center of Alternative Finance is all about. Sure. So I joined the CCAF, as we call it, so like about two years ago. Um, and I've been working with the crypto asset research team. So essentially what we do, the main focus of our research is to study the industry and how it has evolved since the inception of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, and so we publish these annual benchmarking studies, which are based on data that we collect directly from companies. Um, so that's really the main project we work on it uh, on year on year. But uh, recently we also started a mining research project. Um, so we launched the CBCI, which I'm sure we're going to talk about today. Um, and yeah, we keep working on that aspect as well. Awesome. So what attracted you to um, work in the crypto space? I mean, you're, you're doing it from an academic perspective, but you're, you're one of the most knowledgeable crypto people that I know. So how did you get involved? Um, so I was working uh, first for this French association of tech startups and investors. Um, and it was at the time where, you know, it was just when the kind of 2017 market frenzy started. So there were a lot of questions from regulators, from European and French regulators, etc. Um, and, and there was a group of uh, uh, cryptocurrencies companies, so like the Ledger, Coinhouse, um, like some of these small exchanges in France. So we were working quite a bit with them. Uh, but I have to say that I was missing the, you know, the academic research aspect a lot. So I was looking for a research position. Um, yeah. And then kind of find the, the position at Cambridge and yeah, learned a lot since then. Awesome. Yeah. Um, it's been super fun to work with you over the last couple of years. So, um, so today we're going to talk about the Cambridge Bitcoin Electricity Consumption Index or CBCI, um, which uh, has been in the field for about a year um, and provides real time estimate of the total electricity load and consumption of the Bitcoin network. So pretty cool. Um, the model is based on a bottom up approach. Um, and takes uh, different types of available mining hardware as the starting point. So let's let's start there. Um, what was the rationale behind the project? So you know, what were you guys hoping to understand? And what do you mean by a bottom-up approach? Okay, um, maybe I should ask that question to you first. Like, have you ever talked to a non a person who's not very familiar, of, you know, about crypto mining? And what was their first reaction? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I mean, I get a lot of questions, but I think people mostly don't understand um, either what a node is or uh, they automatically think that it's bad for the environment. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's the most common kind of reaction you have as soon as you start talking about mining. And in particular, when you talk to you know regulators or policymakers. So on one hand, we, we had this type of uh, reaction to the research we were doing. And on the other side, we had uh, some kind of defender of the Bitcoin, um, of Bitcoin or like any other proof of work coins um, that were arguing that actually mining was driving, you know, the green revolution because everything was powered by renewables. Uh, right. what, what we wanted to do is to find, to bring some nuance to that debate. Um, and so there were a few papers, academic papers on that topic, and there was one real time index, but we were not very comfortable with the methodology. So we decided to uh, kind of come up with um, our own index. Um, and so the idea is then to have a reference uh, for people to come back each time they have this conversation about whether Bitcoin is burning the planet or not. Okay, so talk to us about the methodology. So you, you mentioned that, you know, there are other models mm -hmm. in the market. Um, so how does the CBCI compare with those other models? And going back to that bottom-up approach, talk us through the methodology so we kind of understand how you got to um, some of the numbers that you've gotten to. Sure. So you, you can essentially group any research project on, on that topic in two, in two groups. So one would be like a bottom up approach to so what we did and the other one would be top down. So our approach is actually um, kind of borrowed from uh, Mark Vivant. And the idea is you look at all the available equipment that is available to, uh, on the market and then you calculate their profitability and then you draw this profitability threshold 
and then you assume that miners will only run the operation if they are profitable and then from there you derive uh, also the electricity cost and uh, the PUE which is the power usage effectiveness mm -hmm. um, and then you you, you reach um, the amount of electricity consumed by the total network uh, I can delve into more, more details after that. But the opposite approach is, uh, for instance, the one you would find on the DigiConomist uh, website, where they kind of uh, look at miners' revenue, assume that about 60% of this revenue comes from electricity costs and utility bills, and then they deduce uh, based on uh, an estimate of how much miners will pay per kilowatt hour, and they deduce how much uh, electricity is consumed by the Bitcoin network. So that's two kind of opposite approach. But what's interesting is you, when you actually compare their results, uh, we're not too far from each other. So that mm. kind of tells you that we're probably kind of close to to a real estimate. Okay. Yeah. A bit of a check and balance, right? Exactly. So um, I understand that given the exact uh, electricity consumption can't really be determined, the CBCI provides a range of possibilities um, consisting of a lower bound to the floor and an upper bound estimate. Um, and that within the boundaries of that range, a best guess estimate is essentially calculated to provide a more realistic figure um, intended to come as close as possible to Bitcoin's real annual electricity consumption. So can you, um, how does that influence the index's results, that best guess? Yeah, so essentially between these kind of three levels, so the lower bound, the, the best guess estimate and the upper bound, what really changes is just these, the assumptions going into the model. Um, so when we calculate the lower bound, which is the absolute minimum of electricity consumed by the Bitcoin network, we just assume that all miners uh, are using the most efficient machine available onto the market. So like uh, S19 or N30. Um, and, and that they have a PUE of, I think, 1.01, .01, which is a very efficient data center. Mm -hmm. um, the opposite assumption for the upper bound is that miner will use the least efficient um, my, uh, mining hardware available, but still profitable, because the idea is that they will not run if their operation is are not profitable. Um, and so that gives us the, the upper bound. And then in between, what we did instead of you know going to one ex extreme or the other is to um, look at all the um, set of hardware that is available to the market and uh, profitable, and kind of give them an equal weight uh, in our distribution. And then we assume a PUE of 1.1, .1, I think. Um, and that give us our best guess estimate. So I think that's fairly more representative because obviously not all miners are running a single type of machine, um, right. but it, ha it has its own limitation as well because it's you know it's probably not fair to assume that all um, mining equipment have the same market share. Yeah, indeed. Okay, so um, understanding all of that, so that you know gives us a bit of context for for why and and what um, you guys did now that the CBCI is a year old. So congratulations. What have you guys learned over the past year? Um, what information do we have today that maybe we didn't have previously that surprised you? Yeah, I actually uh, tied to the, to the light po last point I was making. So there seems to be um, new research or new research methods that will allow us to have a better estimate of the market share of the different uh, mining equipment. Um, I think it was uh, CoinMetrics who initiated that kind of looking at the nonce distribution, they were able to deduce what hardware was behind um, the production of hash rates. So I think in their estimate, it was like 23%. That was before the halving, by the way. Uh, okay. But like 23% of the network uh, was uh, using S9. Um, that probably has slightly changed. Um, so I think if we have slightly more accurate figures of the distribution of each machine, that would be quite helpful. Um, and that's actually also data we're collecting in the in the survey. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the other uh, probably improvement we will make is um, re reviewing or revising this um, electricity cost. So currently we have a fixed cost of five cents, five USD cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and we might revise this estimate to maybe something like four cents because from what we've seen in our discussions with miners and the different survey data we collected, um, it seems to tend towards four cents rather than five cents. Okay, so is that just like a blended average? Because obviously the, the price of electricity fluctuates pretty greatly across the world. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's a global average. Now the idea is uh, we also have this mining map that we released recently. 
And so maybe like we will probably be able to kind of have a weighted average based on the share of each regions uh, of the Bitcoin hash power. Okay. Um, so I had a look uh, this morning at the um, CBCI landing page mm -hmm. and it displays two numbers for each type of estimate. So the electrical power and the yearly electricity consumption. Can you break down what these two numbers are actually telling us? Mm -hmm. So the first one is, so as you said, the electrical power. So that's how much uh, uh, Bitcoin net, uh, network consume in gigawatts. Um, and that's updated every 30 seconds. Um, but then we annualize that figure uh, by multiplying by the number of hours per, uh, per year. But the idea is so then we have a total watt hour, um, the annualized consumption of, of the Bitcoin network. Um, and we apply a seven, um, seven days moving average, so it just moves a little bit because obviously it's not uh, changing drastically. Mm -hmm. Then we're also working on the kind of providing a more cumulative figure so that we will accumulate the amount of electricity consumed maybe you know, per hour or per day instead of having this annualized figure um, at, the, at the top. So yeah, some change that needs to be made there as well. Okay, um, and how have you seen that number vary or fluctuate over the course of the year? Has it been relatively stable? So, you know, pre halvening let's, let's say, um, what, what kind of data um, variations did you see? So obviously, so the, this um, index is a direct function of hash rate. So if a hash rate fluctuates, then the, the index is going to fluctuate as well. Um, and so, for instance, after the halving, we saw a massive drop in hash rate, and so we saw a massive drop in the electricity consumption. I think it was like 30% decline. Um, so it, it does fluctuate along with the, uh, with the hash rate, Bitcoin hash rate. Okay. So um, the, the index gives some comparisons for index. So, for example, Bitcoin versus the uh, total electricity production um, and the total electricity consumption in the world. Um, have you seen those numbers change over the year or has that been relatively stable too? So um, these actually, these um, comparison are kind of fixed on, uh, based on fixed numbers. So um, we need to update them as well regularly. Um, so obviously, it can, again, it changed uh, based on how much uh, the electricity consumption of Bitcoin changes. Um, but the, the real idea of the comparison page was um, to give users a sense of what it means to consume 61 terawatt hour, you know, per year. Um, because if you just throw that number, a lot of people would not be kind of uh, able to, to understand it. I mean, yeah. yeah. So, so the idea was to have, just to put that, that figure in, into context. It's not a direct comparison, but just helping people better understand what that figure actually represents. So for, for people that are watching us and so they're not looking at the index now, yeah. um, give us some comparisons. So, so how does that relate to something else that we might you know, understand today? So we're using this much, this much hash power, this much electricity for, for Bitcoin and it equates to what? So like if we take the one that you referred to, so the total electricity consumption, uh, consumption in the world, so Bitcoin's consumption will represent only 0.27% um, of it. Then we have other figures looking at more uh, in, uh, renewables production, for instance. And then we try to provide some sort of like fun facts. Um, so for instance, one is the uh, amount of electricity consumed by the devices that you, you know, all stay uh, always on, but that mm -hmm. you don't use. Um, so from our estimates, so the Bitcoin network consume the equivalent of 3.8 years of uh, devices that will always stay on in the US. And then, yeah, I think the last one was also because we represent the University of Cambridge, but if you compare the uh, Bitcoin network consumption, um, it would satisfy the energy needs of the University in Cambridge, of Cambridge for 329 years. Yeah, that's a, so that sounds like a lot. <laughs> yeah, then you have to realize that, you know, probably the main source of energy of the University of Cambridge is enough. I mean, it, it, there might be a lot of, um, uh, of underlying explanatory factors. So it's really like, it's, it's to show you how it depends to what you compare it to. Uh, but yeah, it definitely looks like a lot. It definitely looks like a lot, yeah. Okay, so the majority, uh, what, what, what are the majority of the, where is the majority of the network power uh, coming from? So is it, you know, a specific geo region 
or a specific type of mining equipment? And um, give, give us an idea of, of where the origination comes from. Yeah, so that's uh, related to um, the last mining map we released. So we published it uh, just before the halving, actually. So that's data we got, we got directly from mining pools, from three mining pools um, that represent 37% of the total Bitcoin hash rate. Um, and so they provided us with country level and province level data about the distribution of uh, Bitcoin hash power based on the miners that connect to their pool. Um, and so what we see from the data is that as uh, most people would expect, China is the location where most of uh, mining is taking place. So um, the period we cover is from September 2019 to April 2020. And so if you look at the beginning of the period, uh, China represents 75% of total hash power. Um, and in April, it's more around 65%. Um, then the next location, I mean, popular location for mining uh, were uh, Russia, US, uh, Malaysia, and Kazakhstan. So it, there are different interesting trends because uh, obviously, uh, the mining that is taking place in, in China is not concentrated, I mean, is concentrated in the southern region. Um, and so that also varies based on the seasonality. Um, so what we know, what a lot of people know in the mining industry is that um, you have this rainy season in China happening between uh, April, May to September, October. And so during that period, a lot of miners re will relocate their mining activities into Sichuan so they can take advantage of uh, electric oversupply and very cheap electricity costs. And so actually it's interesting because when you look at, um, so we have some figures for October and November and you see that Sichuan is around like 35%, something like this. Um, but then as the rainy season ends, then all the miners are migrating back to other regions where they had, uh, have their operations. So like Xinjiang or Inner Mongolia and primarily Xinjiang actually. So then you see the share of Sichuan like completely decreasing and Xinjiang instead taking, um, taking over. So that's, uh, that's also a very fascinating uh, phenomenon. Yeah, that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. That's I, I, I'm assuming that they're dismantling entire farms and packing them up and relocating them. I mean, you wouldn't have two farms one that you turn off and on because the equipment is so expensive well if you look at i mean you, you have some um, some research piece on that it's quite interesting yeah it's it's massive incredible and then so you mentioned kazakhstan the us um were those the russia um areas that you would have expected to see um, yeah i think uh, so that's mostly like the regions we were aware of um because previously we were already kind of using a different method. We were trying to also assess the distribution of uh, my uh, the Bitcoin hash power. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the one that really came as a surprise is Malaysia. Um, and some people have justified the significant share of Malaysia. I mean, significant, still small compared to, to China, but it's at about 4.33%. Um, and the reason might be that uh, one of the hardware manufacturers actually have uh, some um, warehouse of there. So they might be kind of running their machines and then before shipping them to, to, uh, to customers. Yeah. So that was, yeah, I think that was the biggest surprise for us. And so what about the equipment? Do you have any insight into what the most uh, popular equipment being used is? So no, so far not really. I mean, beyond the coin metrics report I was referring to, um, there is no reliable, uh, I mean, so far, reliable figures about the uh, market share of the different equipment. Um, we have some, some data that we will publish uh, in the upcoming reports. Uh, but again, it's, um, yeah, we need to make sure that the, the sample is not biased in itself. Okay. So, um, so if we're talking about, you know, the, the Bitcoin network could power the University of Cambridge's electricity needs for 300 and some odd years, let's talk about um, the, the, the question that we started with, you know, is Bitcoin mining bad for the environment? What's the relationship between carbon dioxide emissions from mining and Bitcoin production? Um, and, and, and is it actually bad for the environment? Is there a correlation there? Okay, so before delving into the subjective debate, whether it's, it's good or bad, um, so the, we needed three elements essentially to, to get to the uh, carbon footprint, if you'd like, of, of Bitcoin. So the first one is calculate the electricity consumed, then the geographic distribution of hash power, and then what you need to know is the energy mix. So what energy sources are actually powering these mining activities? 
Um, so he, there you had different approach. Um, some uh, reports, for instance, took um, data about the um, renewable penetration uh, in different regions and then calculate mm -hmm. uh, how much of mining is actually powered by renewables. So I think the latest uh, estimate was by Conshare and I think they were saying about 73% of mining was powered by renewable, which in my opinion is a, a little bit too high. Um, the so other, you think it's, it's the number better. is too high or you yeah. think the number is reported as too high? No, I think that the I think the the number is um, is too high. I think I think it's probably because um, it was focusing a lot on Sichuan uh, in China, which is mostly powered by renewable. I mean, a, a region with a lot of renewables. But then the fact that a lot of these uh, activities for the rest of the year is taking place in coal-based regions like Xinjiang or Inner Mongolia, that would actually probably offset the amount of renewables um, in the in the total energy mix of mining. Um, and then you had another approach, which, which was that paper by um, scholars at the Technical University of Munich. So what they do is it, they completely abstract, if you like, the, the energy mix, and they look at the carbon emission factor of the different uh, countries. So that's data you can get from uh, the International Energy Agency. Now, the small problem there is that you only have country level data uh, or country level carbon emission factor. So the granularity you get when you look at, you know, Sichuan or Xinjiang is then completely uh, forgotten when you use China uh, carbon emission factor, because obviously it's not uh, counting, accounting for these regions with a lot of uh, renewables as well. Um, so, so that's what you need to then calculate the carbon footprint. So what we're trying to do is, um, again, using some of that survey data uh, that we, uh, we recently concluded uh, to be able to have a more accurate uh, picture of the energy mix uh, taking place in, in mining. Um, then to the question whether it's good or bad, I mean, that's entirely subjective, I guess. Um, it's um, What's interesting is that when we were building this comparison page, you have very little studies about how much electricity is consumed by the traditional banking system or you know any, any other industry. Uh, comparable to what Bitcoin, for instance, offers. So I guess it's like, yeah, it depends if you think that having a censorship resistant uh, payment and monetary system is relevant um, to the world or not, I guess. And, and that's also what often drives uh, the discussion around mining and energy consumption. You realize that people come with some preconceived idea or have a very strong opinion. And no matter what fact you actually show them, they, they won't necessarily change their opinion. So, yeah. Okay, so so what what is the carbon footprint for Bitcoin today? Uh, so yeah, so we haven't calculated it yet because we're still kind of uh, working on this uh, other estimate of energy mix. But the figure I've seen uh, in the Joule paper, for instance, I think they were about it was twenty two. Um, how would you? Uh, what is the units? Um, but yeah, so it's yeah. I need to get that right. <laughs> Uh, 22, but the, the other one was, um, DigiEconomist was 29 uh, tones, I think. Sorry, should have checked that earlier. Oh, that's okay, that's okay. I threw that curveball at you. So, um, okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about the happening. So, um, the happening happened on the 11th of May. We expected that this was going to have an impact on, on miners and profitability. So, going back to the earlier discussion mm -hmm. about profitability, um, what intelligence do we have from the CBCI um, since the halving? So, what what uh, what's changed, if anything? So, yeah, again, because it's a direct fun function of hash rates. When uh, the drop of hash rate took place, then we saw a drop as well uh, in the overall electricity consumption. Uh, more broadly, I think if uh, with the halving as well, a lot of um, equipment will no, no longer be profitable. Um, so that will possibly have an impact as well on the amount of electricity consumed because if they're not, if you have to turn to like a slightly more efficient machine, uh, then it would, it would mean that you uh, consume possibly less. So that's so far what we can, what we can see. Okay, all right. Um, well, we have um, been receiving some questions from the audience. So if you're, if you're game to answer a couple of questions, I do have a, a few, and uh, please feel free to, to send your questions in. Um, so is that okay? Can yeah, we go through a couple of those? All right, great. Um, okay, so first question, is there a concern 
that mining might become too expensive in the future and that only a handful of owners will be able to keep the network secure. What will that mean for Bitcoin mining? Uh, will that mean that Bitcoin mining will become centralized? I think that, yeah, there's been for a while a concern uh, around centralization risks in mining. Um, and that usually takes, you know, um, place at like three different levels. So the first one is the production of hardware. So the fact that it's uh, concentrated um, by uh, what four main, let's say, hardware manufacturers. Um, mm -hmm. Then at the, at the pool level, so the fact that a lot of these uh, pool operations are operated from China. Um, and then the third one is, yeah, the location, the geographic distribution of hash power. Um, and obviously, so with the halving, the fact that um, some miners will have to be uh, secure the profitability of their operation, um, you would have to be able to, you know, uh, either cut on electricity costs or cut any other costs. Although we know that um, operating expenditures primarily go to paying your electricity bills. Mm -hmm. So definitely miners that will be in regions with low electricity costs will probably have a competitive advantage. Um, now we see that there are really differences in the way the different mining farms are being set up. Um, and so, for instance, North American miners will try to cut their costs elsewhere or maybe use you know, some financial products that will generate new cash flows. Um, so there might be, a, yeah, kind of way to prevent it too much centralization. But yeah, definitely a general trend will be to see a lot of mining taking place in regions with low electricity costs. Okay, so um, so again, that's, you know, places like China, mm -hmm. Kazakhstan, and the US, you know, areas where they have a high degree of renewables. So like Washington State, for example, power is very cheap because it's generated mm -hmm. by dams. Um, like, give us an idea of some of those other places. Uh, another place that is often uh, cited recently is Iran, for instance, uh, because they have uh, a lot of like cheap electricity as well. Um, and recently, the government also announced that they will license miners. Um, so definitely kind of supporting the industry there. Um, we had a few conversation with uh, miners based out of, uh, you know, Middle East, where they also have access to very, very cheap electricity. Um, you also have like Paraguay in, in uh, Latin America. So yeah, definitely a few regions where uh, you will see this happening. The Middle East is really interesting because, you know, you tend to, I tend to think of, um, you know, a natural affinity for cold places, right? I mean, it mining generates a lot of heat in mm. addition to all electricity. So now you've got double the electricity trying to keep everything cool. Mm. Um, and so, you know, th these, these farms tend to be in places where it costs less to keep the rigs cool, right? Mm. Um, but the Middle East would not fall into that category. No, that's a very fair point. Yeah. Although like, for instance, in Iran, you, in Iran, you will have very, very cold regions. But yeah, yeah. Places like Kuwait will make slightly less sense, but uh, I guess if you can take advantage of extremely low price, that will make sense. Well, so then um, if something has, uh, if, if a region has extremely low electricity costs, but they're potentially using double the amount of electricity to run the, the okay. mining operation and keep it cool, let's say, mm -hmm. let's use Kuwait as an example, um, what does that mean for the overall uh, uh, index rating of, of the carbon emissions? Yeah, and that's a actually really a good point. And that's one of the limitations of that model is that we only look at electricity costs. We don't account for any other costs because they are not, I mean, they, they are still minimal compared to uh, the share of electricity costs as part of the total operate, uh, operational expenditure. But that's definitely one limitation. We're not taking into account, you know, the purchase of capital equipment, uh, cooling costs, maintenance, or employees or contractors' costs. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, next question regarding transaction fees. How much does the greater share of transaction fees take as part of miners' rewards, and how might this change the mining landscape? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I think there's been a lot of uh, discussion after the after the halving because we saw transaction fee kind of soaring as a, a share of miners' revenue. Mm -hmm. um, but it 
the fact that the fee market is not very developed at the moment doesn't seem to be too much of a concern, at least, I mean, from, from what we get from miners in our survey. Um, but I think it's, it's definitely an interesting phenomenon because um, there was a study back in 2017 looking at, you know, the factors driving transaction fees um, in Bitcoin. But they stopped in 2017 when fees were still quite minimal. Um, and then after, after that, it kind of like increased significantly. And I think it peaked in like 2018 at like around 12% and then increased again after the halving recently. And so the question is, how does this, uh, you know, transition from a mining based uh, industry, if you like, to a more like market based industry mm -hmm. will completely reshift uh, the dynamics of, of the mining industry. Um, and so I think it's, again, it's not too much of a concern for now, but that's definitely going to lead to a lot of interesting questions uh, in the future. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, next question. Did you notice any interesting mining insights from the recent Bitcoin price movement to $11,000 recently? Um, no, the, the fact that we don't take the pulse of the industry on a regular basis, but only once a year means that, you know, when such movement happens, I mean, we do have conversation with some miners uh, and we can kind of imagine what that would mean for some of them. But uh, yeah, so far, like nothing in particular from, from our side. Um, but yeah, you, you would imagine that, for instance, if uh, some miners sell their inventory at this cost, then they would be able to uh, better cover their fiat uh, express expenses. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what uh, do you have planned for the CBCI in the future? Will you be iterating on the current index? So the, yeah, the index, we're probably going to make a few adjustments into the models. Um, and then we're working on publishing a second iteration of the mining map. Um, for which we would like to have more pools to contribute. So as I said before, we only have three of them, which represent 37%. And we're hoping to get at least three additional pools to, to participate so that we can publish a, a more, even more representative version of the mining map. Okay. Um, is mining more profitable in some countries than others and why? Um, so generally, yeah, I mean, China will have, uh, Chinese miners will have a few advantages. So the electricity cost, which we already discussed uh, significantly. But then um, the fact that there is a concentration of hardware manufacturers based out of China is also uh, greatly facilitating the conduct of businesses and operations because they share, they will share, you know, a similar business culture. The supply chain will be more efficient and shorter. They wouldn't have to pay, um, you know, uh, shipping fees, etc. So you definitely have some competitive advantages in being located in certain region like China. Yes, because you're not paying for, I mean, the, the, the manufacturing is there. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, a, a shorter supply chain, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the access to equipment is greater, etc. Okay. Um, I think we kind of covered this already, but just, just in case we didn't, um, what was the biggest surprise for you uh, the completion of the first year of the index? Uh, oh, for, for the index itself? Um, yeah, I think just seeing how it kind of like evolves and how like the, the combination of this index with the mining map would be able to unleash new, new findings as well and a bit more transparency on, on the mining industry. I think that's very important. Okay. Um, and so I'll ask you, you know, during this process, when you first started, yeah. um, and I remember when you first initiated this, this study, um, we were talking about regulation. You had just come off of a, of a really intensive uh, regulatory assessment um, study and then move from that into Bitcoin mining. Um, so that was a bit of a shift, right, in, in your mindset and looking at, you know, one set of data that's maybe a little bit more influenced by um, subjectivity mm -hmm. into um, a, a research project that's, you know, very binary, you know, the numbers are the numbers. So um, for, as an as a academic, what, um, over this experience over the last year, what's, what surprised you most? Uh, no, that's a really good question. And I think that's the great thing about um, this field is that you learn about so many different things. I mean, I had to get to grips with like energy markets and stuff like that uh, when, when looking more into mining and the electricity consumptions. Um, 
And, and actually, it's quite interesting because when we were doing this regulatory study, we realized that there was so few mention of mining, uh, you know, in regulatory statements or in their guidance and whatever, except for countries or jurisdictions that had some share of, of mining activities. Um, and so then kind of delving into mining. And then uh, since then, we saw actually a few regulatory authorities pu uh, publishing or putting out uh, new statements about mining. Uh, so you had um, some local governments in China kind of saying that um, seem to support some mining activities or at least offering for mi miners to uh, settle their operation next to hydropower power plants. Uh, you had Kazakhstan that passed a new legal fra framework that recognized uh, crypto asset as a property and then uh, also legalized uh, mining activities. Um, currently, there was a, at some point there was a bill in Russia that was um, also kind of uh, planning to set up a licensing regime for mining operations. So it's actually, all of this is so interconnected. Um, but yeah, I think I have, um, yeah, I like the more objective part of the, of the mining research. Well, and I think you raise an interesting point around the interrelationship dependency upon um, a business that's generating growth mm -hmm. for your economy, right? and enabling uh, regulatory um, you know, guidance that allows those businesses to continue to, to exist and flourish potentially, right? And I think in the crypto space, what's really interesting about the countries that you just mentioned, some of them have been um, slower to potentially adopt crypto asset, asset, asset um, bespoke regimes for the assets themselves, mm -mm. right? Um, so the the mining aspect seems to be, you know, viewed as a as a separate business, but it's creating the supply of digital assets that are then being offered on, you know, a a secondary market, right? Once once they're born and created, like Bitcoin, then you know it's it's offered for sale um, and the regulatory uh, clarity in some of those countries has been much slower to materialize around the assets themselves, but interesting that they've addressed it for the mining. Yeah, no, no, precisely. And, and I think that's, again, I don't know what's your view as now that you're part of Binance, but it seems like it's these two industries, like the, you know, the service provider side and sometimes the mining industry side are slightly disconnected. Um, I mean, you, you will talk to some service providers, representatives who have limited uh, understanding of what's happening in, in the mining industry, although that's you know, crucial and that's really the backbone of the cryptocurrency industry itself. So yeah, I think both should always go like hand in hand and even for regulators and policymakers to kind of better understand how these two worlds kind of coexist. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's if you look at, um, you know, Russia, for example, there's been a number of bills over the last couple of years yeah. um, that have been looking at the treatment of crypto assets. But as as you've just said, that the, the, the mining of crypto um, has been almost separated. So this is one type of business and this is another type of business um, and the regulatory treatment of those business types. Um, might be different, but ultimately one is the supply chain for the other. Mm -mm. Yeah, no, that that's that's true, um, and that's very interesting that you. Yeah, again, you mentioned Russia because that was one of the rare jurisdiction that was actually even making a statement about about mining. Um, a lot of other jurisdiction completely ignore that part of the industry. Yeah, and have you seen any correlation between? Um, geolocations where um, potentially there's, you know, geopolitical um, questions around, um, you know, different trading uh, patterns with, you know, between East and West, or, you know, we, we mentioned, you know, Kazakhstan, for example, or Iran, which, you know, in some situations may not be part of your, your average supply chain. And so bringing those countries into a global supply chain, have you, have you noticed an impact there? So, yeah, we haven't, we haven't studied that closely, uh, in fact. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, you would imagine that obviously because like um, Asia concentrate most of the uh, mining activities, then you will see that in the trading patterns as well. 
Uh, no, that's definitely something that needs to be investigated as well. Fascinating. Okay. Well, so um, so my last question to you um, is from me. Um, what what's next? What are you going to be looking at next um, in this space? And and what questions are still unanswered that you'd like to dig into? Um, so yeah, next uh, is the upcoming reports, the crypto asset benchmarking study. So that is looking both at the crypto asset industry and service providers. Uh, so yeah, I think we have very interesting data over there, um, and I really look forward to be able to, to share some of the, these findings. Um, and then more more specifically, I think I'd be really keen to um, delve a bit more specifically into mining because I think there is still a lot of things to be explored. Um, and I, I think the CCF is in the position of you know this independent position of the, and being able to actually collaborate with different set of actors that will not necessarily talk to each other. Uh, so I think that that's a great opportunity as well. Fantastic. Great. Well, so um, let's let's give our viewers some information. So where can they find the C uh, CBCI? Uh, so the CBCI, you can find it by just typing cbci.org um, in your in your browser. Um, I would not give you the CCF website because it's just atrocious. It's super long, but essentially if you, I mean, it's because it's part of the university. So you have to, anyway, if you Google it, it will be much faster. But otherwise, if you go on my Twitter profile at uh, Apolline Blondin, then you'll find all the relevant links. Okay. So Twitter, you can get you at Apolline Blondin. Yeah. Okay. okay. And if um, the, our viewers would like to learn more about the work that you're doing, at, uh, at the Center for Alternative Finance. I think your uh, best option is just to Google CCAF uh, Cambridge, and then you'll find the, the website and, and the publications. Brilliant, okay. Um, and I believe um, you will be announcing the, the findings for um, the benchmark in when, September? When yeah, you I think we're that? aiming for mid-September for publication, so yeah. Definitely, yeah, keep an eye on this. Well, when, when, that, when that's published, we'd love to have you back so we can kind of dig into what was, what was interesting about uh, this year's data. Absolutely, that'd be fun. Perfect. Apolline, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I really yeah. enjoyed our chat. It's always great to see you. Me too, and I hope to see you soon again. <laughs> okay, yes, I know, well, one day in, in person, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks very much for joining us today, Binanceans. Take care. Thank you.